please welcome Robert Rutherford. Andrew Orvidal. That's my good friend, Andrew Orvidal. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, so I went on tour in 2009 with a band, a Denver-based band called Everything Absent or Distorted. And it was a short tour. We were out for 10 days total. We went to Chicago for a couple nights, Detroit, Pittsburgh, and then we played two nights in New York. Uh, any of you who knew that band, it was big. There was eight, uh, eight members that were always in the band. And when we played shows here in Denver, generally it swelled up to 13, 15 people. But on this tour, there was eight of us, and we crammed into a 15-passenger van uh, with all of our gear and hit the road. And after a handful of days, uh, after Chicago and Detroit and Pittsburgh, uh, the stench was fairly unbearable. Uh, eight dudes in a van and uh, marking their time away from home with the sort of quiet and not so quiet acts of desperation that you would expect from a gang of mid 30 year old professional dudes who are trying to pretend to play rock stars. So by the time we got to New York City, uh, you know, we were pretty sick of one another in a, in, a, in a loving way, but we were tired of one another. And uh, we had been sharing various blow up mattresses and, and we actually, there, the, the, a lot of those dudes did get under the covers with one another in various Motel 6s across the Midwest. And because uh, our accordion player had a sister in New York, she was like, I'll take care of accommodations for you. And she's like a mover and shaker. She's like a Brooklyn mover and shaker. So we were like, this is going to be awesome. So she lined up accommodations for us. And she said, just don't worry about it. Just come into town and, uh, and we'll take care of you. As we're driving from Pittsburgh to New York, she calls and says, so bad news. I just got a call from the guy who was renting me this apartment where you all were staying and it has flooded. So you can't stay there and I'm working with him, but in the meantime, you're going to have to figure it out. All of us respectively had people in New York, so we were sort of all making our phone calls and scattering to the five boroughs, um, which would have been a pain in the ass, but, but it was just something that we had to deal with because we didn't have any money to pay to stay anywhere. So as we're sort of coming through New Jersey into crossing the bridge onto Manhattan, we get this phone call from... Andy's sister, and she's like, okay, I worked it out. I called the dude whose apartment flooded, and he, uh, and I yelled at him, and I said that this was completely out of line, and he said that he has a loft in Brooklyn, uh, and you guys can stay there. He lives there with his family, but it's a big place, and you can stay in the living room, and we were all like, you know, the thought of trying to coordinate eight dudes scattered to the five boroughs to play two shows in two nights, it, it just sort of, it sounded like we were trying whatever we could do to figure out a way to all stay together, just for logistics and, and trying to take care of the less responsible among us. Um, it, but as she sort of described it, we were like, we don't want to sleep in this guy's living room and his family's going to be there. And, 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 she, and, and then she said that he was going to have to charge us. That it wasn't much that, you know, he had air mattresses for all of us, but that uh, but we would have to pay $35 a night each. And we were like, oh, I don't know. But then she said some magic words. She said, but he's got booze and you can drink free the entire time you're there. <laughs> and we started doing the math and we were like, this is awesome. So we agreed to it. So we get there, and, it's, and it's, a, it's a loft that's right at the base of the Brooklyn Bridge on the Brooklyn side in the Hasidic Jewish neighborhood. And, uh, and we get out of the van, and we're tired, and we're stinky, and we ring the doorbell, and he's on the top floor of this building. And uh, let's just, I'm going to call him Jack Nicholson. That's just to save some, save some face. Uh, and... Uh, this young woman answers the doorbell and she says, we're going to send down some girls right away to get your luggage. And we're like, wow, that's really weird. <laughs> but sure enough, all of these very young girls, not, not, not too young, but, you know, <laughs> 18, <laughs> come and they're trying to carry our luggage up the stairs. And I, I, like, it was too much for me. Like, I, I, like I was, that was weirding me out. I, so I carried my own bag. 
up the stairs. And we get upstairs, and it's this, it's, it's an amazing loft. It has 30-foot ceilings, and in the middle of this central room, uh, there's this suspended fireplace um, with logs burning in it and these 30-foot windows that overlook uh, the southern uh, end of Manhattan Island. And it's gorgeous. And, he has, and there are all of these young women sort of floating around the place. And, and, and then Jack Nicholson comes down and introduces himself. And he's just sort of like this really handsome dude in his mid-30s. Uh, and he introduces himself and it, uh, opens his liquor cabinet. And he's like, you know, you guys have a drink. I know you guys have been on a long trip. And he starts giving us the layout. And he has some cleaning people sort of floating around at this time too. One of which is this tiny Central American woman. She had to have been about this tall. She was tiny, just this tiny little thing, and she didn't speak a word of English. And she was, uh, that we were pulling down glasses off of the bar, and she was trying to get something and couldn't reach something. So I tried to make friends with her. So I tried to employ my horrible Spanish to talk to her, and she just sort of didn't want to talk to me. So I, I let it go. I handed her what she needed, and she went on her way. All these girls were floating around. And the sort of the one weird feature that really stood out in this weird immaculate loft was that uh, when I went to go use the restroom, you went into the bathroom and there was toilet, shower, and in the shower there's a window facing the living room <laughs> in, from the shower. And I use the restroom and I go outside and I'm like, you guys have to see the bathroom. And everybody sort of takes their turn in there. And then somebody, like Jack Nicholson, is floating around this entire time. And he's, he had a word for his, all the young women who worked there. They were Nicholsonettes. Uh, and, and, and it was just sort of, it just felt weird. It was like we stumbled somehow after all of these Motel 6s into the Playboy Mansion in, in Brooklyn. And somebody was like, uh, so uh, the bathrooms, what's with the window and the shower? And he said, you know, it's for... Parties. <laughs> so that sounded like a reasonable answer. And we looked upstairs uh, in this 30-foot uh, ceiling. Upstairs, there was a, a bathroom on the second floor that also had a window in the shower facing the living room. And so we Googled Jack Nicholson to figure out what his story was. And it turns out that he actually is like this dude who throws topless parties. And you can go, like, you can pay $1,000 and go to Jack Nicholson's house and be served by topless women while you watch the Super Bowl. And that's, and that's a thing that you can do in Brooklyn. <laughs> and this is where we were staying for three, for, for, for three nights. So anyways, all of this is just to set up. So everyone, so like we had been in the car all day. Everyone started taking showers and, there, you know, everyone was taking blurry photographs of the guys in their boxers showering and trying to hide their privates. Uh, after after uh, all these days with these guys, like I really just wanted to enjoy my time in New York. I wanted to be away from them. I didn't want to just like get drunk at some weird bar and sleep all day. I wanted to go out and see New York. So I was determined to do that on my own. So that night we went and played a show. We came back, there were candles everywhere, there was Sade playing on the stereo system, and eight air mattresses for all of us. And we went to sleep, and there was a fire burning in the, in the suspended fireplace, cauldron thingy. And at 6.30 a.m., the legion of cleaning people come out and start mopping around our inflatable mattresses and turning over wood and adding wood to the fireplace. And it, it, I, so I just got up and showered, and I, was, I went and showered on the second floor because I figured then I could stand in the shower naked and lord over my band <laughs> as I scrubbed a night of drinking away, which I did. It was beautiful. And then I left, and I went, and I walked around New York by myself, avoiding the phone calls of my bandmates. And I tried to strike up a conversation later that afternoon with the tiny Central American cleaning lady, and that failed again, too. But she was always just sort of present. Uh, it was like they, she just it was always on and cleaning and moving about and shifting and mopping and wiping down. Second night, uh, I also didn't get drunk. I got up early and did the same thing, lorded over my band members while I scrubbed down, uh, and then I went out into New York. But the third morning, our last morning there, 
the, the cleaning ladies start emerging, and all of the guys have many pillows over their heads to avoid having to listen to them mop and clang around in the fireplace. And it was early enough that I was like, screw it, I'm just going to shower on the first floor. So, and the, the night before was the only night we were in New York where I truly tied it on. And so I got to bed around 3 and was getting out of bed at 6.30 and wanted to head out into New York and still had that hot exothermic reaction happening where after sleeping for a few hours, you just sort of, and I, there's a lot of hair under these clothes, I just sort of became swampy. Swampy, and I, and I looked horrible, I was bleary-eyed. I get into the shower on the first floor, and I start showering, and then uh, I notice that the tiny Central American cleaning lady is pulling sheets off of my inflatable mattress and setting them on the couch, and I thought, oh, she must not have seen me, and so I turn, and I, I'm trying to figure out if she's gonna see me and move away but she pulls everything off and sets it on the couch that's facing the window, the shower window. And, uh, I, so, and I turn around and I'm like, well, that's still happening. I'll, I'm, so I'm trying to, as much as I can, but it's a full window, get out of her field of view. But then, and she's looking at me and she's making eye contact and, uh, and she's not shying away. She's sort of, She's not into it. She's not giving me signals. But she's just, it's like the television's on. <laughs> for parties. That's what the shower's for. So I think about it a second, and, I, and I'm still waiting. But every time I sort of peek out over my shoulder, she's just, it's like she's chewing cud. She's folding sheets now. And she's just looking directly at me. So I think, I have no idea why anyone would want to watch me wash a swampy night of drunk out of my butt crack. So I went for it. I turned around and I gave it to her. <laughs> I scrubbed the front as much as she, and, and she just watched. She, she didn't, she didn't, uh, she didn't, her expression didn't change. She was just folding sheets. She went to sort of mopping a little bit. I got into the back, which was really where, that was sort of the problem area and scrubbed, <laughs> scrubbed that, that part of the night off. And, uh, and, and she, she eventually sort of went about her business. I got out of the shower, and, um, and that was the moment that we shared. And that was <laughs> by far, even for all the music we played to zero people all across the Midwest, <laughs> by far that was the moment that I, that's the, that's the highlight of that tour for sure. <laughs> and that's my story. And thank you so much for listening.